The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Many decisions made by county commissioners, directly or indirectly, impact the lives of children and families in the community. Our guest today, Hennepin County Commissioner Randy Johnson, will be discussing some of the issues he feels are most important for families. Commissioner Johnson will be interviewed by Charles Brown, director of the Hennepin County Library. Commissioner Johnson, we're delighted to have you with us for this segment of All About Kids. I thought we might begin by discussing a few things that perhaps our viewing audience doesn't know, you know, don't know about you. One is um, the fact that you are a father of two, and I was wondering if you'd mind telling us a little about your daughters, their ages, their interests, that kind of thing. Sure. I always like talking about my daughters. Uh, my older daughter, Carrie, is 13 years old, and she's in eighth grade. Uh, she is very interested in theater. Uh, mm -hmm. She attends uh, classes at Children's Theater after school in Minneapolis. She's been in a number of productions of various kinds with the Bloomington Civic Theater, Nine Mile Creek Theater Company, and, and other productions. And she's very happy when she's acting, and she's very interested in uh, theater and in baseball. And my younger daughter is in sixth grade, and she's 11 years old. And uh, she's interested in watching theater, but she's not particularly interested in acting. Her main interest now is horses and she loves to ride horses. Mm -hmm. She loves even to muck out barns. Uh, she really wants us to get a horse for her, although <laughs> I'm not quite sure how we're going to swing something like that. Right. But she loves to ride horses, and she's also very interested in money. Oh. Uh, she, uh, she wants to be wealthy, she said, and I think that's just fine. That's great. Sounds terrific. Uh, another thing that our viewers may not know is the fact that you're a vice president of the National Association of Counties, better known as NACO. Can you tell us a little about that organization and also what your involvement means for Hennepin County? I, I was elected uh, third vice president of NACO, the National Association of Counties, just in August of 1994. And as third vice president, I'll move up uh, like a lot of trade associations, third vice president for a year, then second vice president, first vice president, and I'll be president of the national organization in 1997, 1998. That's wonderful. And NACO is the organization that represents the 3,100 counties in, in the nation in Washington. We have a major lobbying and legislative representation presence with Congress and with the federal agencies. And we also provide services to the member counties, uh, research functions and financial advisory functions, with the deferred compensation plan. Uh, so it's a large organization, and I'm the first person from Minnesota ever to be elected to the executive board. So we're really excited about that from Hennepin. Oh, that's great. Um, I know that the Minnesota Family Investment Plan is something that uh, was actually spearheaded, I believe, here in Hennepin County, although it's since become a national, uh, a national effort. Can you tell our viewers a little about the plan, um, you know, what it does, what it hopes to accomplish? Well, it started in 1986 when the state legislature had a very bitter deadlock about what to do with welfare and welfare reform for aid to families with dependent children. And one group wanted to cut back on the benefits and another group wanted to increase the benefits and hand the money out even more quickly. And they had a, a, a deadlock, very bitter fights about it. And the governor at the time, Governor Perpich, decided to appoint a 10-member commission, uh, five conservatives and five liberals, and I was asked to co-chair that group. And people thought that there would be no possibility that we could ever come up with a recommended welfare reform plan that the 10 of us would ever agree on. And uh, after six months of hearings, uh, lo and behold, we came to an agreement on a proposal, a whole series of recommendations, basically the, uh, conser the liberals came to recognize that there's absolutely nothing wrong with expecting able-bodied people to do something in return for a welfare check. And the conservatives recognize that if you expect people to go to job training or something else and they have children in the home, you're going to have to pay for some additional child care and some additional health care benefits. And th those are the basic elements of our proposal. 
Uh, we started in April of 1994 with a demonstration project in Hennepin County and three other counties in Minnesota. And it turns out that the Minnesota Family Investment Plan is really turning out to be the basis for the compromise in Washington on welfare reform. So quite a bit ahead, we think, of the rest of the, the country on this. We also decided to target our benefits and attention to the relatively small number of people who are on AFDC welfare for a long time. We found out that in Minnesota, most people who are on AFDC use the program exactly as it's intended. They're on for less than two years or maybe three. The st families are stabilized. And mom, and I say mom because that's the situation about 90 to 95 percent of the households here, uh, goes back to work, gets off of AFDC and public assistance, uh, maybe marries off. But in whatever case, we see that person very seldom, if ever again, on public assistance. So th that's working. What we want to do is concentrate our attention on the people who are the likely long-term recipients. And we know who those people are in the day that they apply for the most part. They're under 22, they've never been married, and they do not have a high school diploma or a GED certificate. And so those are the people that we want to concentrate on right away. It's a small number of people, but because they may be on the program for 20 years over that period of time, they collect most of the benefits. I see. Can you tell us how that plan um, is similar to the statewide effort going on, going on next door in Wisconsin uh, at this time? Uh, Wisconsin has a number of different initiatives, some of which uh, we think read real well in the paper and, and look good on TV. The Learn Fair program, it sounds real good to say if you have children and they're school age and they don't go to school, we're going to cut your welfare benefit. But what they've had to do in, in many counties in Wisconsin is, is any savings that they thought they had or good incentives are more than eaten up by hiring a whole platoon of attendance clerks in the schools. So the programs really become very administratively top heavy. And uh, we think that there are incentives that we can provide for, for families so that the kids want to go to school. And that's a much better incentive. Great. You also mentioned the national effort that's currently under discussion in Washington. Uh, do you know legislatively how th what process is going to be used to try to c come up with a national uh, program that will focus on uh, at least el eliminating or curtailing to some degree the number of people on welfare? Well, there are a number of different proposals in Washington right now. And this is uh, September of 1994, and Congress is likely to adjourn in another three weeks or so, and it's very unlikely that there'll be any welfare reform done this year. Uh, there is a bipartisan approach that I think next year will receive a lot more attention from the administration, and it's probably going to include most of the elements of the Minnesota Family Investment Plan. I think this is the right approach to welfare reform. You concentrate your attention on the people who really need it. The goal of the program should be to help people get off the program, to help able-bodied people to become as self-sufficient as they possibly can. Great. I know another topic that people are frequently talking about today um, is the environment. And I think especially our young viewers uh, who are learning a lot about environmental issues in school and are very concerned about their future on this planet. Uh, can you talk a little about the environment, uh, I guess especially as it relates to um, uh, the waste um, you know, related matters? I know that you're the leading spokesperson on the county board uh, in, this, in the environmental area, and I think our viewers would be interested in some of your thoughts about that. Well, I, I chair our county board's public service committee, which is a committee that's responsible, for example, for solid waste management for garbage, and that's one of the major responsibilities of the county. Each city decides how the garbage is going to be collected in that city, and we have 47 cities within the county. But once that garbage truck is full, it becomes the county's responsibility in, in this state to figure out what to do with it. And 15 years ago, most of the garbage that was generated in Hennepin County ended up going to landfills. And we know that what happens with, with landfills is almost inevitably the older style of landfill starts to leak and uh, leachate gets into the groundwater. These are very, very expensive to clean up. They may have been cheap to operate at the time, but they are very expensive to clean up. So what we've done in Hennepin County is move to a system where we focus first on recycling. And in 1993, Hennepin County residents recycled about 38% of our total waste stream. In addition to that, we sent for yard waste composting about another 12%. So in Hennepin County, we're recycling and composting almost 50% of the entire waste stream. That is probably, well that is the highest percentage that is diverted to recycling and composting of any major metropolitan area anywhere in the United States. And we were able to set up that program because of the great cooperation we get from the people who live here 
and especially recycling with, with children and uh, children in school because they know that this is important, that it's the right thing to do to separate those materials, get them into the, into the blue bin if they live in a single family home, and allow us to, to reuse those resources. And uh, we only sent 2% of our waste to a landfill last year unprocessed. 2% uh, is also probably the lowest percentage of waste going to a landfill of any major metropolitan area. And the remainder was burned for energy and electricity in two very modern state-of-the-art waste energy plants, one in downtown Minneapolis and the other one jointly with three other counties that's run by Northern States Power and United Power Association in Elk River. And we don't just burn the garbage, uh, but we take the heat, generate steam, and generate electricity. And the plant downtown, for example, generates an, enough electricity to supply the, the needs for a city the size of St. Louis Park. Boy, I had no idea. So it's, we're trying to do something positive with garbage. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting what's happened is just a few years ago, uh, all over the country, in, in many cities and counties, people wanted to get rid of their garbage and send it some, to somebody else's backyard, and they'd put it on barges. And we all know about the famous Marlboro barge that went down the East Coast and the Caribbean, I think even to some South American ports before it came back to New York. And other cities and counties put it on trains, and the trains weren't allowed to dump it anywhere. Well, that garbage that everybody was fighting to get rid of a few years ago, now people are fighting to get their hands on. There's a major battle in Congress right now as to who has the rights to that garbage. Because once the plants are built, the modern plants to handle this the right way, you have to have enough garbage coming into them to keep them running. And there's still people out there who know that in the short run, it's cheaper to send it to one of the older landfills, but in the long run, it'll be more expensive. But I guess they figure they won't be here in the long run. Right. But our children are going to be here, and somebody's going to have to pay for that. Well, I know I can attest to the fact that um, recycling in particular is, I mean, a high priority for Minnesotans. I recently moved here from the Washington, D.C. area, and um, people in, the, in that area of the country talk a lot about, you know, uh, environmental issues and, you know, uh, recycling, et cetera, but it really is a way of life here. And I'm wondering how, what was the educational process that was used to make everyone focus on the need to conserve and to, um, you know, to not spoil the environment. How was that, how was that accomplished? Well, we, we've tried to work with the schools and with teachers, providing educational materials, providing posters. Uh, most of our haulers, our garbage haulers, have been very good about sending reminders with the bills that are sent out or leaving reminders with the garbage cans after they're emptied or the, the blue boxes advising people on what's the right thing to do. Uh, what we found here in Hennepin County and in most of Minnesota, if, if people know what's the right thing to do, and if you remind them occasionally, people do the right thing when it comes to the environment. People are often amazed when they come to Hennepin County. They walk down the streets of downtown or in the suburbs, they see our parks, and there isn't much litter. I mean, we think that there's right. litter. I mean, because in, in Minnesota and Hennepin County, littering is socially unacceptable. You just don't throw a gum wrapper or something. Uh, you, you stick it in your pocket until you come to a trash can. We really value our environment here. And I think it starts at home, it starts in the schools. Uh, the government role is to remind people from time to time of what to do. And I, I'm very confident, very optimistic in this state. You, you let people know what to do and remind them occasionally and they'll do the right thing. Great. I know another area that you have a particular interest in is technology. And uh, it amazes me these days when I see two and three year olds who seem to have a natural talent, a natural ability um, to work on a personal computer or to understand the relationship between pressing a key and something happening on a, on a monitor. Um, what do you see as some of the uh, you know, developments on the horizon uh, related to technology? Uh, I'm excited about the technologies because I think that they're going to allow us to communicate with each other much better. I think that they will allow us to provide a whole variety of government services at less expense and to provide a much higher quality of service. I think that young people, you, you mentioned young people with computers, uh, uh, people about my age and older tend to be somewhat afraid of using a computer. And people who are, uh, say, under 40 right now, uh, tend not to be afraid, and if they're school age, they love to do the work with the computer, not just the games, the arcade type games, but learning and word processing. And I have a story about that. I, I mentioned my daughters. I got my first laptop computer about four years ago, and I'd only taken half of a word perfect word processing course, and I brought it home. And, and my daughters, who were then about well, nine and six, were real interested because they'd grown up with Macintosh computers, and they'd had 
Max at, at, in school and, and my wife has teaches computer technology to elementary kids in the Eden Prairie School System. And so, you know, the three of them were very familiar with it, but they were all kind of interested in the laptop because it was smaller than what they had been used to working right. on. So I turned it on, I was clunking away and, you know, drafting some letters and things, and I, I did something wrong, and everything kind of froze, and I couldn't figure out what to do. And my daughters came over and were kind of kibitzing over my shoulder, and, and uh, Carrie said, well, you got to find out what, me what you told the computer to do. And I said, well, it's real easy. You know, I punch the key and the, it comes up on the screen. So, oh, no, there's more to it than that. Something has to tell the computer when you got to the end of the line, you go to the next line. And I said, well, why doesn't that show up on the screen? And she said, well, Dad, everybody knows that if all those instructions came up on the screen, you wouldn't be able to read your text. She said, oh, this is a, a IBM PC clone. So why don't you hit this reveal code? That looks interesting. And I said, what are you doing? You're going to break this. You're going to lose my data. And she said, Dad, you can't break these things by punching the keys. And you haven't got anything valuable in there yet anyway. There's no data to lose. And so the, the two of them figured out what I had done wrong and undid it and got me back. And to them, it was just you know, another tool. Right, right. And, and that's when I began to realize computers are tools. They're not toys anymore. Uh, I think they have lots of applications. We're looking at the county at the, the date when people will be able to apply for the wide variety of permits and licenses from their homes or from their businesses instead of having to come to the service centers or the various government agencies and stand in line. Uh, we're looking at a lot of uh, imaging applications so that instead of a lot of computer data entry people typing a lot, we just take the document and put it into the imaging machine and the, the data is automatically entered. Uh, libraries are tremendous information technology resources in, in, in your area. Just the tremendous amounts of information that can become available remotely or the libraries becoming sources of uh, computers themselves where people can come and use that. The access to the internet, the uh, web of 40,000 different types of networks, being able to access from this library we're in, in Ridgedale now, but being able to access what's in libraries throughout the entire world, being able to communicate with people throughout the entire world. I was on the internet last night and was talking garbage with somebody from Australia back and forth and comparing what we're doing with what they're doing. And those things were unthinkable just a few years ago. Uh, people often say, in this country, we have to make sure that there is a computer in every classroom. And I don't think that's right. I think that what we have to work for is a, a computer in every backpack. You know, that, that every child has a computer. These are going to be tools, just like uh, when we went to school, it was pen and paper. Right. Now it's going to be some kind of computer. It may be some type of a personal digital assistant, like the Macintosh Newton or one of the others that's similar to that. It may be more like a laptop or a sub-notebook type laptop. But I, I think that uh, the, the tremendous information technology revolution is here. It's very real. It, uh, people say it's going to be very expensive, and I say, well, so was television when television came True. out. And now we have in this country television in about 97% of all households. I think in, in five to eight years, we're going to have computers in 95% of all the households in this country, and the cost is going to come down dramatically. In fact, I think we'd be much better off with computers in every household instead of television sets a lot. You could be right. <laughs> Um, how do you see us moving toward this goal of, um, of a computer in every backpack? Because we really are moving you know, toward a, a point where we're going to have the information haves and the information have nots. And I agree with you that we should try to ensure you know, that every child has as much of an even playing field as possible. But how do you see us moving toward that? Although I know the prices are coming down. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see everybody be an information have. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to happen overnight. And you are absolutely right, prices are coming down. We've seen dramatic changes in prices just in the last 12 months. And it seems like every 18 months, you get more computer for about two thirds of the money that you paid before. And I think that that is going to happen faster and faster too. But there's still gonna be that initial purchasing area. I think that a lot of this may be done through the schools. And uh, perhaps savings from buying published books may allow us to use this as the, the information. You can download books off the internet now. You can download all kinds of information off of, of other networks. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot of savings in transportation. I think we're going to be seeing savings in printing and publishing. I think that uh, you know, this may be the first year since we started using computers in a big scale 40 years ago that there's actually less paper printed because of the computer. For years and years, we had more paper printed because 
people didn't quite trust the machine to remember all of this in the hard disk or in, in floppy disks. And I think now people are much more willing to trust the computer. They know that it'll work and we're going to be using less paper as a result. Now, all, all of this, I think, is going to result in savings. I think that the total overall cost of the computer revolution is going to end up being less than if we hadn't done it. Great. You mentioned the Internet or the um, super information superhighway earlier. Um, how else do you use it? In addition to communicating pe with people around the globe, um, you know, what other um, you know, things do you do through the, uh, through the Internet? Th through the Internet or through other information uh, networks like the, the commercial services like America Online and Prodigy and CompuServe, people, in addition to communicating with electronic mail, can access various newspapers around the country. Uh, I, uh, for example, had a subscription for a while to the Atlanta, Georgia, Atlanta Constitution newspaper because I was going down there to speak at their state association of counties meetings and I thought what could be better for for a month before I go down than to read the, the Georgia State newspaper and when I got down there people wondered how come I knew so much about the details of Georgia politics and Georgia government and I didn't tell them I'd been reading every night on the electronic mail their their newspaper uh, there's also access to information in other libraries uh, you can order uh, instead of going to the mall, and I don't want to discourage anybody, by the way, from going to the Mall of America, which is in my district, or any other merchant's malls. Right. But you can also order material from uh, a wide variety of merchants and save that trip. Uh, you can buy stocks. You can actually list your home for sale. You can apply for mortgages and finance homes. Uh, you can get all kinds of educational software to manage your own money. Uh, computer games, of course, are, are always popular, and, right. and not just with children. Uh, so there's a wide variety of entertainment, information, organization, personal self-development. Uh, yeah, I, I probably use my laptop computer on average of three to four hours a day, and it makes me much more productive. It's also entertaining occasionally, right. and I, I'd really like to see that that computer in every backpack. And I, I hope in another five to ten years, that's what we're going to be seeing in Hennepin County. Well, until that day comes, I do want to encourage some of our viewers to uh, to visit their local uh, Hennepin County Library if they haven't uh, recently. <laughs> uh, over the summer, we installed over 800 um, online public access catalogs. We've done away with the old card catalog, and so our entire catalog is online now. And in a very non-threatening environment, individuals who may have some phobia regarding using uh, a computer can come in and try it out. You know, and you know, search our our holdings online. And we also hope to provide public access to the internet within the next year or so. Good. So um, we're excited about that development. On another uh, front, uh, we discussed earlier um, welfare reform, but health reform is also very much um, you know, on the front pages of, you know, these days. What do you see happening in that area? What do you see happening with the great debate that's curr currently going on in Washington? Well, this, this is difficult now because we're taping this in September of 1994. And uh, Congress will probably adjourn before most people see this on cable TV or as it's rebroadcast. So I have to make a prediction now, and they're all going to know whether I was right or wrong. Uh, I think that Congress this session will pass some kind of uh, incremental health reform legislation moving towards universal access, but not a program that will get us there right away. There isn't enough money identified yet on how to provide universal access. I think we're going to see changes on a more incremental basis. I don't think that there is going to be one big comprehensive overall plan. Uh, we have to remember this is a huge part of our economy. It affects uh, every person who lives in this country. Uh, it affects a huge number of employees. And trying to shift all of these costs around as one big program is not going to happen. Uh, I know Senator Dernberger has predicted that this Congress will pass and the President will sign a bill that ironically is pretty much the same legislation supported by President Bush in February of 1992, but it received very little attention then. And it's a program that expands coverage to more people, uh, imposes uh, some, the beginning of some kinds of market uh, reform caps on, on spending or competition to keep uh, spending levels down. Uh, it looks a lot like the Minnesota model, what we're doing here in Minnesota. And Minnesota is generally considered to be one of the two or three states with the most advanced health care system. Of course, from Hennepin County, we look at health care very, very carefully because there are 1.1 million people who live in our county. We also have 11,000 employees of Hennepin County, and so we're an employer providing health insurance, and so we look at it that way. 
The Hennepin County Medical Center in downtown Minneapolis is one of the largest public teaching hospitals in the entire United States. It provides uh, training, uh, well, nearly half of all the physicians in the Twin Cities area receive some or all of their, their training at the Hennepin County Medical Center. So we're a teaching hospital. We're also a major provider of health care with up to uh, 900 licensed beds. We fund uh, a, a network of community clinics throughout the county, so we're involved in, in that sense. So Hennepin County is a player in many different ways. We have our own health maintenance organization, HMO, that's available to our employees, certain people on public assistance and others. So we see it as an HMO provider, right. sort of as the insurance company. So we're very, very interested in what happens in healthcare because uh, it's, it's such a big issue that you push a little bit here and the result is down here and it was a very unintended result. So you push a little bit there and all of a sudden it, it, it comes out up here. So we're, we're watching that very carefully. Do you know, um, especially if it, as it relates to children, if uh, any special efforts are being made in, in the area of prenatal care? Because I think while healthcare is very good, very solid here in uh, the Twin Cities and in Minnesota in general, in many parts of the country, the infant mortality rate, I'm thinking of Washington, D.C., the state of Mississippi, and other places, is comparable to a third world country. And I, I'm just um, wondering if any of these uh, programs that are currently under discussion have an emphasis in the area of prenatal care, or if you know about anything about that. Very definitely. In, in our state and in our county, uh, we have always put very high emphasis on prenatal care because the amount of money that goes into it, the returns are very, very great because uh, premature babies, very expensive to the health care system. Uh, children born with birth defects or with problems that could have been prevented, not only the tragedy that it happened, but also the expense of taking care of the problem that could have been prevented. Uh, and you're right, uh, although we do pretty well here with prenatal care, there are parts of this country where uh, prenatal care rates and care rates are similar to third world countries. And that's simply unacceptable in a country as wealthy as ours, in a country where we do have the facilities available. A lot of it's education. Uh, there are still people, and, and we kind of say, how could this be? But there are still people in this country who don't really understand that, that as soon as you think you're pregnant, you should certainly be going to see a doctor right. and that you should continue to go and see. And this is just something that has not occurred to them. I think it's something that we have to stress as part of the school curriculum. Uh, we have to stress it with children. I think it ought to be part of public ad campaigns. But of course, there is some upfront spending that's involved in that. And this cannot be provided in a lot of communities at the local level. The local resources, the local property tax base, which is the only tax resource most local governments have in this country, is simply not big enough. It has to be done on a larger basis, it has to be done through states, it has to be done. Uh, and I don't look to the federal government to do much because they don't do a lot of things very well. But I think that this is one area that is of such crucial importance that they could be doing a lot more. Great. Well, thank you very much. Believe it or not, our time is up. Already? Yes. For this episode, we've um, had the, you know, the pleasure of uh, interviewing Commissioner Randy Johnson. And thank you very much, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Charles. Government officials face some tough issues and hard decisions. Today, Hennepin County Commissioner Randy Johnson has given us his solutions for some of the problems affecting children and families in our community. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Hennepin County Library Director Charles Brown. And thanks to all of you for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency. We thank you for watching and we hope you visit your public library often.